During the 17th century, there was a cavalry formation in Europe, which, when coming to the battlefield, almost immediately made enemy forces run for their life. What was it? The winged hussars. This is Michel Levayatan Sarbet, and this is a new episode of Voyennik TV. The Winged Hussars, one of the most important, most prestigious, and most decisive cavalry formations of all time. This was the pride of Poland during the 17th century, a formation which enabled the Poles to score several crushing, crushing victories over their enemies, including the Battle of Vienna, 1683 or the devastating defeat of the Swedish-Russian forces at Kuoshen. One of the battles during which uh, the Hussars were also successfully employed was the Battle of Khochim, 1416-21, against the Ottoman Empire. And today a presentation and a review of a game covering this battle. This will be the review of Khochim Potenga Husari, or if you prefer, Khochim the Might of the Hussars. This is a very interesting project and because of several reasons. The first one is that it was published by Stowarzyszenie Pospolite Ruszenie Szlachty Ziemi Krakowskiej. This is an organization, a non-profit organization, which uh, main objective is to popularize Polish history, Polish culture. And one of the ways in which this organization tries to do it is creating board games. And Hocim Potenga Husari is one of them. Secondly, this is a game which was uh, co-funded by the Polish Defense Ministry uh, because this was a game which was created in commemoration of the 400th anniversary of the death of Hetman Stanisław Żółkiewski. Now, Stanisław Żółkiewski was a very important Polish leader, Hetman, who fought one year later at Cezora. This was a battle also fought during the against the Ottoman Empire in Moldova, 1620, but there the Poles were defeated and Stanisław Żółkiewski was killed. But his death was a big shock to Polish society, to Polish nobles, who decided to impose, uh, to impose extra, uh, extra taxes in order to raise new armies. And those armies which were raised thanks to those funds, repulsed the Ottoman attack in 1620 at the walls of the Hochim fortress. So the roots of this, uh, of this successful defense of the Hochim fortress were one year before, one year before in Moldova when Stanisław Żółkiewski was killed in action when retreating from his expedition to this country. Now, this is a game which was designed by Łukasz Wrona. This is also a very interesting young Polish designer who was, for instance, the designer of Semper Fidelis, another game covering one of the most important Polish moments in history, the successful defense of Lwów after the First World War. And here the game was co-designed by Marek Piwoński. This is a game for two players, aged 12 or higher, and the time of play will be somewhere around 90 to 120 minutes. This is a game which, I said, as I said a few moments ago, will, cover, will be covering the Battle of Hochim, a very interesting battle in all terms, because, by all means, because this is a battle which was not a pitched battle in the sense that we know it. This was a series of battles of different actions both of clashes in front of the Hochim fortress, so in open field, as also at the road leading to Kamieniec Podolski, another Polish fortress from which supplies were brought to the garrison defending Hochim, and also when the Ottoman forces, outnumbering the Polish 
garrison tried to storm the walls. So this was a very interesting and also a very important battle because the successful defense of the fortress managed to secure the Polish border and uh, ended in negotiations which finally led to deciding that the war should be ended on a status quo basis. Today a presentation of the game, I'd like to show you how the elements of it look, then I'd like to briefly explain what are, it, what are its basic concepts, and at the end of the review I'd like to give you my final thoughts and my final recommendation. So without further delay, let's begin. Here is a look at Hochim Potenga Husari, or if you prefer, Hochim the Might of the Hussars. Now, this game is a game for two players in which one will take control of the Polish Lithuanian, so the Commonwealth forces defending the fortress of Hochim, and the second player will take control of the Ottoman forces besieging this fortress and trying to overcome the Commonwealth defense. Both players will have different objectives in their game. The Poles will try to firstly defend their camp, so they will try to forbid the Ottomans to breach their defense lines, and they will also try to diminish Turkish morale up to the point this morale reaches the lowest level and their morale, their morale collapses. If it does, the Poles score a decisive and instant victory. The Ottoman side will try to break through the Polish defense lines and to take control of the Polish main camp, which is situated in the central part of the board. The game can last up to five turns, and if neither, if neither side achieves their main objective, the game is instantly stopped, and we, we pass from the military perspective, we pass from the military struggle up to a diplomatic phase, during which the outcome of the battle, the outcome of the game, will be decided through negotiations. Each player will try to, uh, will try to gain the control of five negotiation cards, which can uh, decide, for instance, of the fate of the Hochim castle, if the Ottomans manage to convince or rather to impose their will, the Hochim castle can be, uh, can be destroyed. But if the Polish survive, if they uh, manage to if they manage to have enough arguments during the negotiations, they can, they can uh, leave the Hochim castle just as it is in Polish hands. Other issues can concern, for instance, Moldavia, which can become subjugated to Poland or that can become part of the Turkish sphere of influence. In order to take control of those negotiation cards, both players will be using diplomacy cards acquired throughout the game. Those cards are ranked from 1 to 3, 3 being the strongest, and during this final phase of the game, both players will, uh, will use those cards and they will, they will associate those cards to the corresponding negotiation, uh, negotiation subjects. Then we compare the value of the cards. Uh, add it to each negotiation card and the side which has the biggest number of points manages to, uh, to impose their will. So, as you can see, the battle can be resolved both on the battlefield as also, uh, as also due to final negotiations. And this is due to the fact that the Hachim battle 1416-21 was a very special one. It was not a pitched battle, it was not also a classical siege. We had everything in this battle. During the few weeks when this battle took place, we had both, uh, both uh, pitched battles fought at the outskirts of the Polish and of the Ottoman encampments. We had 
uh, we had tries by the Ottomans to breach the Polish, Polish or Cossack defense lines. So we had attacks against the fortress, we had artillery duels, we had some skirmishes on the over part of the Dniester River when Polish forces tried to, uh, tried to uh, reach Kamieniec Podolski in order to bring supplies to the besieged forces. So we had really a lot of different actions. And the authors of the game decided to include in this game a lot of such special, a lot of special mechanics, a lot of special cases, which are in place in order to simulate how the battle was fought. Both players uh, having different objectives have also different assets, which they will be using during the game. There are two types of those assets. Firstly, the armed forces, so the, uh, the soldiers that will be fighting the battle, which are represented by small wooden cubes. Every side has three types of cubes. The Ottomans have the black cubes, which are Tatar forces, green cubes, which are Turkish cavalry, the Spahis forces, and finally the yellow cubes, which are the Turkish, uh, the Turkish legendary Janissaries, so the infantry which will be used mostly at mostly during uh, during um, attacks on the fortified parts of the Polish encampment. The Commonwealth side will have also three colors of cubes. The white cubes will be infantry units, especially useful when defending those outskirts and in general the fortified areas, because they will have a a bigger power when defending such places. The red cubes, on the other hand, are cavalry units, including the famous legendary hussars, winged hussars, and those will be extremely useful, especially during pitched battles, because we can fight also pitched battles in the game. Finally, the blue cubes will be, will be the Cossack forces, extremely useful during the game, and this is also a way to reflect their, uh, their importance during the battle fought in 1621, because we had several thousand Cossack forces which were fighting alongside Polish-Lithuanian forces at Chocim. Uh, this was the time when Ukraine, where the Cossacks were part of the Polish Commonwealth, uh, then things became more dire and more, more complicated, but at the time of the battle, uh, both nations fought alongside against the Ottomans. Now, the second type of the assets which will be used by both players are cards, because Hachim Potenga Husari is a game which will use, which will be uh, which which has cards, which is using cards during the game. Each side has their own deck of cards, which includes units or leaders which were taking part in the Battle of Hochim. So we have, for, exa for example, Alexander Elias. We have Baylor Bel Yusuf Pasha on the Ottoman side. Each of those cards, as you can see, with a fantastic artwork and with two information. Firstly, with a number, indicating the number of cubes which can be moved when playing this card for its, uh, for its uh, for its value, and secondly, a special action which can be triggered when playing this card for an action. So when playing a card, you can decide if you are using it for the points or you want to trigger the action. Apart from those decks, which I said are different for both sides, each player will have also a set of three major leaders. And on the Ottoman side, we will have uh, the Tatar Khan, Janibek II Gerey, will have the Vezir Hussein Pasha and the Sultan Osman II. On the Polish side, those three major leaders will be the Cossack Hetman Piotr Konaszewicz Sachajdaczny, will be having Stanisław Lubomirski and, of course, the Grand Hetman, Lithuanian Hetman Jan Karol Chodkiewicz. Those are the three major leaders, which are special cards because they can be used each turn, but only once during a turn. So during each turn, each player will have a certain number of cards 
uh, to be played during a turn. Among those cards, three of them will be always placed face up on the table. Your opponent will be always knowing that you have those cards and you can use it. The other cards will be randomly drawn from the deck and you will be using also these cards as your assets. Hotkevich is a special card because he is here in the game during the first three turns of the battle. Then on turn four, he unfortunately is removed from the game and this is due to the fact that historically during the battle of Hochim, Hotkevich died during the battle, not because of wounds sustained during the battle, but he was ill and he died during the battle, which didn't fortunately uh, hinder Polish resistance and finally uh, Poles managed to survive the battle even though Jan Karol Chodkiewicz didn't survive and didn't see the end of this epic struggle. So this card is removed on turn 4 but the Poles will receive another card as re a replacement. Now during the game I said a few moments ago that the game can last up to 5 turns. Each turn will be played in a pretty similar way and uh, during each turn, firstly, we will have a preparative phase during which we will be verifying, for instance, if we have some units which are revolting because the lack of, uh, of um, supplies. Then we will also prepare some other things such as, for instance, uncovering new, uh, uncovering new diplomacy cards which are placed next to the board or uncovering used leader cards. But then we, we pass to the most interesting part of the game, to the, uh, to the phase during which both players will play cards. And as I said earlier, we have three cards which are always face up and we have also a hand of cards. The Poles will have fewer cards and additionally they have to start the turn by playing the first card which means that at the end of this cycle it's the Ottomans who will be having more cards in their hand and they will be able to take two or sometimes even three card plays in a row which will grantly give them an edge during the end of each turn but this is also a way to simulate how the battle went because just looking at the number of cubes on the board we can clearly see that the Ottoman forces are more numerous we have 36 Ottoman cubes at the game start compared to 21 which are part of the Commonwealth army so this is also a way to reflect the numerical, the numerical uh, disparity between uh, both armies. Uh, when it comes to the, card, to the card play, as I said earlier, we have the option to play a card for its points value or for its action. The rule governing how to move cubes on the board is extremely simple because the rules say that we can take cubes from anywhere we want but we can place them only in one target place. And in general, the board, as you can see, is divided into different sectors. Now, we have big sectors with their name. For instance, we have the base, the main Polish encampment, we have the castle, we have the readouts, etc. And those are sectors in which we have several places onto which we can place the cubes. Um, at most, those will be defensive areas, obrona, which indicate that cubes in such a location will defend the access to the entire zone. But we have also places where we will, where we will be putting cubes in order to activate special actions. And for instance, here we can place the Cossack units on special places which will reduce enemy morale or, or which will increase our supplies, reducing the number of Ottoman supplies. So during this alternative card play, we will be placing moving cubes, sometimes placing them onto the neutral part of the board where pitched battles can be fought, preparing for attacks, and all those places have a different meaning. So for instance, we can place Yanchari cubes onto a special place in order to build ladders, which then will, can be used when attacking, uh, when attacking 
readouts. We can, for instance, send some of the Polish forces to Kamieniec Podolski in order to bring supplies to the besieged forces, etc. So the fun in this game consists in choosing where to send our units and what actions to choose, because we won't be able to do everything. After this phase, we pass to the diplomacy phase, during which both players will draw cards from the diplomacy cards available for the turn, starting from the Ottoman player if he controls any Polish readouts. If he doesn't, we look at the number of, uh, of broken units, and it's the army which has a fewer number of broken units which starts, which starts drawing cards. As I said earlier, those cards will be used if the game enters into the negotiations phase and at that point they will be used in order to try to gain those negotiation cards. After the diplomacy phase, we pass, we pass to the effects phase during which we will trigger all the special special places on which cubes were placed earlier. So we will trigger the effects, bringing supplies, increasing morale, lowering morale, making, uh, making over effects which will take, uh, which will be, in, which will be uh, resolved instantly or sometimes which can be resolved a little bit later. Finally, we have the supply phase. Now, this is also a very important part of the game because in the game we will be not only tracking action on the board, but we will be tracking action on two additional, additional tracks. The first one is the track indicating the supplies of both armies because we have two separate cards for each nation. And we will be tracking the level of supplies and of the morale of our army. At the same time, on this board, we'll be also placing broken units, eliminating units, and revolted units, units, those who decided not to fight because they aren't supplied, they aren't happy by their treatment or by the conditions in which they are supposed to fight their enemy. And if this level of supplies drops, ever drops to the uh, to, to the zero leave level, the game is also instantly stopped and uh, it is instantly moved to the negotiations phase. So it is also a way in which the game can last fewer than five turns. Now, as you can see during the supply phase, we have to supply each and every unit which is on the board, paying supply units. So if this marker drops too low, we will take some losses due to fatigue, due to illness, due to lack of supplies. The morale level in influences the number of units which revolts, but at the same time, it will also indicate the number of diplomacy cards that we will have that we will have to discard before entering the negotiations phase. In the case of the Ottoman army, bringing the morale of to zero means also an instant defeat. In the case of the Polish army, bringing the morale of the army to zero makes also the game instantly enter the negotiation phase. The Poles can lose the game if they lose the control of the remain encampment. And after resolving this phase, after eliminating some units, after, uh, after reducing supplies, after also uh, changing the level of morale, we finish a turn and we replay a new one. Once more, uncovering our leaders which were used during the previous turn, draw drawing new cards and, the end, and playing a new turn. Now, I haven't spoken anything, I haven't said anything about battles. We have two different types of combat in Hochim. The first one is a pitched battle and the second one will be attacked against the fortified areas. Now pitched battles are fought all, on, all, only on the neutral part of the board, the Przedpole, which is the part of the board separating the Polish fortress and the Ottoman encampments. And here we can place cubes when using, uh, when using cards for points or when activating some actions. If a battle is triggered, both players will roll a certain amount of dice. The number of dice depends on the units used. In general, Ottoman units in pitched battles will always use only one die per cube. The poles will use one die per cube, but 
Polish cavalry gives you two cube, uh, two, uh, two dice uh, per cube. So this is the strongest unit in pitched battles. Both sides roll their button, roll their die, rolls their die, using some modifiers which can be the effect of cards played or special special actions triggered, and we compare the number of sixes, fives, and fours. Sixes in general result in breaking a number of enemy units. Fives and fours makes enemy units retreat. It's the side who has a biggest number of sixes, fives and fours who wins and who receives a, uh, one additional diplomacy cards and who can also uh, increase their morale by one point. Pitched battles can be fought numerous times during a turn. They can be triggered when the minimum number of cubes is placed on this on this spot or if the number of cubes reaches the maximum which is always indicated in the case of each spot on the map. Attacks against fortified areas are resolved in a different way because here, firstly, it's the Yancharis, so the, uh, the yellow cubes of the Ottomans who have two dice uh, and the Polish infantry have two, uh, has two dice. All of our units have only one die the sole exception are also the Cossacks defending their encampment. They are fighting with two dice also. Uh, here, uh, another change is the fact that we take into, the con into consideration also the level of the fortification. So, for instance, when attacking such a place, we will subtract two from each Ottoman die. So even a six rolled will become a four when attacking a very well fortified area. Of course, the Ottomans have some ways to reduce uh, this negative factor. They can use uh, the construction of ladders, uh, some special actions, some cards also render additional bonuses. Uh, we roll dice also corresponding to the number of cubes involved in this, uh, in this combat. Uh, Sixes again are, uh, are results which make enemy units to be broken, whereas fours and fives make opponents retreat. The attackers have to obtain a number of results which is sufficient to make each defender bra uh, to be broken or to, uh, or to retreat from the defending area. If they manage to do so, they, they can take control of the sector uh, which was attacked. If they failed, so if at least one defending unit survived, all attackers have to retreat. So battles are resolved due to die rolls, which can be modified by several factors. And those are pretty it, all the basic rules governing Hochim, the play of Hochim Potenga Husari. Now I'd like to pass to my conclusion, I'd like to share with you my thoughts about this game, I'd like to tell you what I really like in it, but what I also think are the a little bit weaker points of this title. So let's pass to the conclusion right now. Hochim Potenga Husari, Hochim the Might of the Hussars, is a very interesting project. As far as I know, this is the only game covering the Battle of Hachim, which is rather surprising because this was such an interesting, such an important battle, that it is a great subject, a great topic for a war game. And I am glad that we have now such a game and that it was designed by the Polish designer. The Battle of Hochim was a very complex battle because, as I explained a few moments ago and during the introduction, this was not a classical pitched battle. It was a series of different, uh, different clashes, both at the at the in front of the Hochim fortress, as when the Ottoman infantry tried to storm the walls, as also when both sides clashed on the road to Kamieniec Podolski when. Polish wagons, Polish convoys tried to bring supplies to the besieged for for forces in Hochim. So this is a complex battle, a battle which is uh, is such a such a broad thing that it is quite difficult to simulate it on a on a game board. But in my opinion, both the authors Łukasz Wrona and Marek Piwański achieved uh, achieved this uh, this simulation of the battle 
at the same time making it still very accessible and quite easy to grasp. So this is quite an achievement and this was done thanks to this interesting and pretty and pretty clever system of allocating forces. This is a war game which in some way resembles some euro games because you will be uh, you will be uh, allocating forces to very specific places. This is somewhat a worker placement game in which you will be choosing where to place your own cubes in order to achieve some benefits, in order to activate some effects. Of course, this, is, this would be an oversimplification if I would say that this is a Euro game. This is a pure war game, a very interesting one with clever mechanics. What I like in this game is, this, is the fact that this interesting and very complex battle was simulated in a very, uh, in a very interesting way. Firstly, you have this layer of sending your own troops to specific places in order to achieve some in order to obtain some benefits or in order to defend some spaces. So this is the first part of the game. The second one is based on hand management because you will be drawing cards, you will have your own deck of cards and there you will have your own leaders who have two distinctive options. You have the possibility to activate a leader for its capacity or for the points. So it's up to you how to use it. So again, you will have an over mechanic which will include hand management. And this is also a way to introduce to the game a lot of chrome, a lot of interesting historical facts. Because on the cards we have the historical names of, uh, of leaders, of troops, so regiments or overs, uh, of tactics which were used at the Battle of Hachim. Thanks to it, we have a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting facts, a lot of small things which make the game more interesting and more, uh, more both interesting in terms of gameplay as as in terms of learning new things. So it has a higher educational value. Thirdly, apart from the cards, apart from the units, you have also those two other very important factors which are supply and morale. You have to take a closer look at them and you have to keep them in mind because having a very high, a very low supply means more of your troops will be removed from the game at the start of each turn and also the risk of entering immediate negotiations is higher. The morale also determines the number of troops which will desert, which will refuse to fight and in the case of the Ottoman forces it can even ultimately lead to your defeat. So you have a lot of different things and another factor which you have also to take into consideration are the diplomacy cards because if the battle is not won on the battlefield or at the, wa at the walls of the fortress it will be decided due to negotiations. So a lot of different things that you have to concentrate on. You have to decide what, prior, what are your priorities, how to use your assets. And this makes this game quite unique because you have so much layers, you have so much decisions to make. This is not only a war game in which you will be deciding where to send your troops, how to prepare attacks, which troops to leave behind, how to trace supply, which is rather classical for many war games. Here you have a lot of different factors and I love it. I love it because those are not very uh, very complex things. The rules are quite easy to grasp and the game has a great flow. It can be easily ended in 120 minutes, sometimes even even faster if a game ends in sudden death. So when it comes to such a complex battle, it's really very accessible. I like the fact that the game uh, comes with fantastic artwork on the cards. Um, the artwork not only is extremely climatic, but also it adds a lot of chrome because just looking at the uh, at the clothing of uh, the soldiers depicted on the cards make you instantly think of the 17th century and it adds so much to the game. 
the artwork is really fantastic. At the same time, those cards are very functional because you have just one digit, you have just one, uh, one number indicating the number of action points and an action, which is very pretty straightforward, not a very complicated thing to, uh, to, uh, to do. What I like also is the fact that uh, in the game, both sides are totally asymmetrical. The Ottoman forces and the Polish Commonwealth forces are totally different and playing both sides is extremely engaging, is extremely interesting. I have seen some war games in which playing both sides gives you, uh, gives you a lot better feeling, a, a, a a better feeling and a worse feeling because there are some games in which playing one side will be boring, will be repetitive, will consist only of uh, keeping a line, a current line defending against enemy attacks. Here you have really a lot of things to, to do playing both sides because when playing the Poles you will constantly be feeling that you haven't enough troops. You will constantly have the feeling that you are outnumbered, that you do not that you cannot do everything that you want, that the line can be breached at any time. Playing with the Ottomans, you will have this feeling of having an overwhelming superiority, which cannot be used to its power because you have inferior troops in terms of quality. And this is a nice balancement because although the Yancharis are extremely powerful, they are used also for other actions than only storming the walls. You do have to use them to build ladders. If you want to increase your morale, you will have to send four Yancharis to, the, to another spot, etc. So I like the fact that playing both sides is very different and at the same time it, it makes you feel playing a very different game. You'll always have this feeling of uh, not being able to do everything that you want. At the same time, the tempo is different because the Ottoman forces, the Ottoman player will have at most times more cards in his hand and at the same time, it's the Polish player who will have to start playing a card during each turn. So the Ottoman player not only having more cards, will also have the upper hand at the end of each turn, having the possibility to play two, sometimes even three cards in a row, which is a great, great benefit. So this asymmetrical approach, the fact that both sides work totally differently, makes this game quite unique and very interesting to play from both perspectives and increases also the replay value of this title. Now we have only one scenario, but this is a scenario which s such a number of variables with such a number of different things that you can do that each game can be played differently. You do not have only one approach to this game. You cannot decide, for instance, to concentrate only on one place. You sometimes will decide to attack the Cossack encampment. Sometimes you will try to breach the walls through the east, sometimes through the north. It's up to you how to decide. At the same time, playing the Poles will also be very different because you will be adapting to the Ottoman strategy, trying at the same time to reduce enemy morale, because morale is what will be very low at some moment when it comes to Ottomans. The same concerns supply. You have a big army, but your supplies will be dropping very quickly and your morale can very easily be brought to a very low to a very low level. So this game in all terms is very interesting, is very engaging. It's very historically accurate because the authors of this game are passionate historians. They know what they are talking about and they managed to include in the game such a number of small details, such a, chrome, such a quantity of chrome that this game is very, very interesting, also from the historical or educational point of view. When I would, uh, if I were to, uh, to say what I think are the weaker points of this game, I'd say that the first thing concerning this game, which might have been done better, is the rule book, because we have, I had some doubts uh, how to play the game after reading the rule book. I had some questions which I addressed directly to the author. I received very quickly 
very quickly response concerning how to implement some mechanics. But even though I believe that the rulebook could have been written a little better with a better explanation of some mechanics, I know that a fact was to be prepared, so with those frequently asked questions it will be possible to play it without those doubts. But even so, having this in mind, you, you should have in mind that this game uh, comes with a, an okay rulebook which could have been done better. The same concerns the text on the cards, because there are some typos, nothing very, very, very terrible, not, not ortho orthograph um, mistakes, but some typos do appear on cards, which means that both the rulebook and the cards should have been corrected more, uh, should have been corrected better before the game got published. I have seen some complaints concerning the board, because it is quite a complex board. You have such a, such a big number of, of spaces, such a big number of, of places to which you can send your units, that when looking at this board at first glance, you might feel it is very, uh, it is very clumsy, it is, uh, it is not very accessible, not very easy to grasp. And I'd agree, because when I have seen this board for the same time, I really didn't know how to read it. I haven't seen the connections between the spaces. I absolutely didn't know how to use those spaces. But this, this is due basically to the fact that the game is quite original in the mechanical, uh, in its mechanical core. Um, when, you, uh, when you learn how to use those spots, when you learn how they impact, what impact on the game they have, it becomes much easier. But even so, I believe the game board could have done been uh, could have been done a little bit better uh, in terms of its visibility. Now it's quite complicated, especially at the beginning. The last thing are the dice, because this is a thing which I almost always underline. I know that some war gamers, some players, do not like do not like games in which die roll in each. In each in which dice rolling is an important factor of the game. And in Hachim, dice are important because they decide of the outcome of both pitched battles and when storming the walls. So I have seen some situations, I have experienced battles in which I had an overwhelming superiority and I failed to achieve my objective because I rolled very poorly. I also managed to defend very important sectors with the poles because my opponent rolled very poorly and I rolled, for instance, two sixes. It happens and it is a thing which will happen because where there are dice, die rolls, always this randomness can be a factor. This is not a very, very important factor determining the outcome of the game because, mind you, the battle is not decided only on... Uh, only uh, Due to, due, due to battles, due to fights between opposing armies. It can also be, and very often is, decided due to negotiations. So having this in mind, concentrating not only on the battlefield, but also what will happen later, is an important element which you should always, uh, always keep in mind. So dice, die rolls, yes, they are here. You can, to some point, uh, to some point influence their outcome because you have some die roll modifiers both on cards and on special places uh, but of course sometimes those die rolls can be very cruel as in all games including dice concluding Hachim the might of the Hussars is an extremely interesting Polish project covering one of the most important battles fought in the first part of the 17th century this is a game interesting in terms of its mechanic core, in terms of its uh, chrome elements, in terms of the different layers that you have to take into uh, consideration when playing, because you'll have both hand management, um, placement of your cubes, allocating them to the uh, corresponding spaces, you'll have supply, morale, finally you'll have diplomacy, a lot of different interesting things. If you have the opportunity to grab a copy of this game, which is quite difficult because the game was published only in a very uh, small and uh, in a limited quantity, you should definitely try it because it's a very interesting game. Although it is a game published only in Polish, 
but we will have also foreign editions foreign languages editions i know that over editions are possible it's up to the designers to decide to decide of the fate of their own child this was the review of Hajim Potenga Husari, The Might of the Hussars, published by Pospolite Ruszanie Szlachty Ziemi Krakowskiej. Thank you a lot for watching this review. I invite you to our other videos on our channel. We have some other reviews in English. I also invite you to take a look at our Instagram and Facebook accounts. And if you want to support Wojennik TV, you can become one of our patrons. In that case, take a closer look at our Patronite account. Have a terrific day and see you next time.